It is a pleasure to be here today with Alana Kershan, who currently resides in Jerusalem. She is the author of If All the Seas Were Ink, published in 2017 by St. Martin's Press, documenting her journey as she engaged in Daf Yomi, studying uh, one folio of Talmud a day. She's translated books of Jewish interest by Ruth Calderon, uh, Benjamin Lau and Micha Goodman, as well as novels, short stories, and children's picture books. And she serves as the book's editor of Lilith Magazine. So thank you so much for taking this time to talk. Thank you. So just to jump right in, um, how did you get started on Daf Yomi? And what has kept you going throughout this six and a half year cycle? Um, so I started learning Daf Yomi about well, it was over a decade ago. Um, at the time, I wasn't particularly interested in studying Talmud. Um, it was really more of a coping mechanism than anything else. Um, I was going through a difficult period in my life. I was getting divorced after a brief marriage. I was living alone in Jerusalem, thousands of miles from my family and closest friends who were back in the States. And I was just feeling very depressed. And the only thing that really got me out of bed in the morning was that I had a friend I used to go running with. And one day my friend mentioned to me somewhat casually that she had started learning Daf Yomi and she suggested that I try it too. I had heard of Daf Yomi. I knew that it was an international program to learn the entire Babylonian Talmud at the rate of one page a day. And if you do that, it takes seven and a half years to complete a Daf Yomi cycle. But for me, the idea of seven and a half years was really unfathomable. <laughs> My marriage had just fallen apart. I wouldn't sign a rental agreement for more than six months. I was really put off by what I perceived to be the misogyny of the Talmud. Um, most of the women in the Talmud are either some rabbi's wife or daughter. Very few have independent identities. Um, I was also put off by the sheer massiveness of the text. The Talmud consists of some 2,700 pages, right, divided into 37 tractates. Each of those tractates consists of several chapters. It just seemed like such an enormous commitment. And as I was thinking about all this, my friend, my running partner, stopped me and she said to me, Ilana, but you're feeling so stuck right now. Don't you think that maybe if every day you learned a page of Talmud, then eventually a new chapter might begin for you? And I thought about that. I thought, wow, you know, if every day I learn one page of Talmud, then with every passing day, I wouldn't just be one day older, I'd be one day wiser. <laughs> and I really began to realize that that's actually very much the Jewish view of time, right? The rabbis teach in Pirkei Avod, in the Mishnah, that when you're five, you're supposed to begin studying Mikra, Bible. When you're 10, you begin studying Mishnah. When you're 15, you're supposed to begin studying Talmud. At that point, I was nearly twice the age stipulated for beginning to study Talmud, but as we learn elsewhere in that same text, if not now, when? And so I thought I might just give it a try and take up this commitment to Daf Yomi and see if maybe the project of learning a page of Talmud a day might pull me forwards, kind of like a treadmill. Um, and so I took it on really almost on a whim without really being able to commit for, for very long. Um, but it as soon as I started learning, I began to realize that Everything about the Talmud really surprised me. I thought of it as a law code that tells Jews how to behave. And really, it's not. It's really much more of a record of conversations among the rabbis in which many of the questions are left open and unresolved. Really, the Talmud is a book for those who are living the questions more than people who have already found all the answers. And unlike the Talmudic sources I had encountered before, which was always in a format of a source sheet with quoted passages cut and pasted onto a page, I found that studying Talmud in context, page after page, was a completely different experience. I was fascinated by how the stream of rabbinic consciousness unfolded, proceeding associatively rather than by any rational scheme. I was working at the time as an editor and a literary agent, so I spent my days thinking about literary structure, coherence, and it was fascinating to me how the Talmud is at once the most highly edited text and also the biggest mess simultaneously. Um, and I really found myself sort of following along, 
as the rabbis engaged in their debates, feeling like I was tossed about like a rough wave when their arguments became stormy. And soon studying Talmud, it really just became, I guess, I would listen to recorded podcasts. I would go to classes. Um, I learned every day, no matter what was happening, I found some way of integrating the learning into my life. And it really became the soundtrack for my life. Um, and it's a habit I have not been able to break. I'm now um, almost finished with my second cycle, um, sort of like a, an addiction. <laughs> um, and and so, yeah, so that's how it all began. You make, it a, you make a very inspiring case why others might consider such a path. I wonder what, if you have any concrete or even abstract advice for others who might want to, might, might want to start this. Um, well, um, in, in the Talmud, in Masachet Eruvin, the rabbis say, If someone is walking along his way and has no companion, he should occupy himself with Torah. Um, and I think that really became sort of my motto. I was going through a very lonely period in my life and studying the, the, the activity of daily studying really became my companion. Um, and I think that especially at times in life when we're feeling unmoored or unsure where life is going and time seems to be an enemy, like, oh, with every day, I'm just getting older. A commitment to studying a text can be very, very, very helpful, um, stabilizing, inspiring. I, When I first started learning, I remember feeling like it was very solitary. I was just learning alone in my apartment. Um, but very soon it became clear to me that Daf Yomi is never a solitary pursuit because tens of thousands of people learn Daf Yomi around the world, and they're all on the same page following the schedule that was fixed originally in 1923 by Rabbi Meir Shapira, the founder of Daf Yomi in Lublin in Poland. And so even when I was alone at home, I realized, well, actually, no, I'm really part of the world's largest book club, and I'm essentially occupying this enormous virtual classroom in which sitting ahead of me are rows and rows of scholars who've studied this text in generations before me, and further on in the row where I'm sitting are other students of Talmud elsewhere in Jerusalem, where I live, in B'nai Brak, in London, in Manhattan, in Muncie, in Phoenix, right? Everywhere in the world, there are people of the book, there are people studying Talmud and studying Daf Yomi and studying the same page. Um, so I think that realization also very much helped me along, knowing that if I missed a day, then I'd be behind everyone else in the world who was learning and we would no longer be on the same page. I had many experiences I write about in my book of flying on an airplane to go somewhere for work and learning that day's page of Talmud on the plane only to discover that the person sitting next to me is also studying Daf Yomi and is open to the same page and we would have a conversation. So I write about some of those learning Torah while flying, or I think I call it Torah from the heavens in my book, those experiences. Um, and, um, and I would also say in terms of just practical advice, I think there are many, many ways to learn a page of Talmud. Um, certainly when I began, I really didn't have the skills to learn the way I learn now. And it was much more listening to recordings of classes, trying to follow along to the best of my ability. Um, but over time, um, I've had many, many, there are many different ways in which I've learned the page, the daily page of Talmud. Um, Sometimes I've been more strict about what it means to learn a page. Sometimes it was enough just to listen to a podcast while I was washing dishes or walking to pick up my kids. Um, but I think that sticking with it and being flexible, being flexible about what it means to learn, you know, the Talmud is often described as being as vast as an ocean, right? Yama halacha, right? That Jewish law is like a great sea. And just as with an ocean, you can access, you can access the ocean on many levels, right? You can just skim the surface. You can, you know, swim underwater. You can become a deep sea diver and get to know all the flora and fauna on the ocean floor. I think the same is really true of the Talmud. Um, it can be accessed on so many different levels and maybe not, maybe it's not for everyone, a commitment to daily study um, of Talmud specifically, but there are programs, there's a program to learn a page of Talmud a week. Um, one can learn Parsha, right? We are blessed with such a rich and vast textual tradition. And I think part of what I'm trying to argue in my book is that I, I very deeply believe that the more people engage with these texts, the more people study Torah, the more Torah we create. Um, yeah. I don't think 
any two people read the text the same way. No one person reads the text the same way at multiple points in his or her life. So if we, the more, the more we encourage people to study these texts, the more, the more creativity we're inspiring and, and the more faces of Torah we're, you know, traditionally Shivim Panim La Torah, there's 70 faces of Torah and we are un- uncovering those faces for the world. Um, so that, that motivates me to try to inspire others. That's too. amazing. I, well, I, I mean, I feel incredibly inspired by what you're saying. As someone who has, has picked up and put down off Yomi over and over again, I feel like you're pushing me to recommit. I keep thinking of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter saying, we should make these public commitments because the power of shame, once you've made a public commitment, <laughs> will, will ensure that we, we commit. But, you know, uh, and, and I wonder, because you brought your personal life in in such a profound way, that um, I wonder if this has been in some ways an intellectual response to existential loneliness and uh, social alienation, maybe even at times, uh, throughout history, in the sense that um, I know for myself, when I feel alone, I sometimes feel myself in conversation with a Kaddish Baruch Hu, um, or in conversation with Maimonides or Spinoza or Brewery and Rebbe Mayer, and that is really profound. And then, as you also said, in connection to the global learning community, um, is amazing. But it's also not just the past; it's the future. We're creating more Torah. So I really love what you're saying, um, and I, and I personally feel inspired to, to uh, for myself to recommit. And if I do one day, I'll credit you as uh, <laughs> on the derech. So let me ask you one last question. Um, You've learned so much Torah. I wonder if you might point to just one, just one of your many favorite passages that you feel like it's one you come back to in your heart or in your mind or continue to shape your thinking. Is there something you came across that wasn't just like five minutes and, and it's in and out of your head, but actually one that stays with you that you might share with folks who are less familiar with Talmud learning? Um, so I'm debating between a few, but... Yeah. Um, well, one of my favorite passages appears in the second chapter of Masechet Sanhedrin, um, where the rabbis talk about it. It's, it's that, that chapter is about the responsibilities of the king and, and also the, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. And among the responsibilities of the king, we're told um, that the king is obligated to write his own Sefer Torah, his own scroll of the Torah. We actually just read this a few weeks ago in Parshat Shoftim, um, in, the, in, the, in the weekly Parsha cycle. The king has to write his own Sefer Torah. Um, and then actually the rabbis say in Masechet Sanhedrin that the king actually has to write two Torah scrolls, one of which he keeps at home um, in his treasury and one of which he carries with him wherever he goes. And the rabbis say it's supposed to be like a like an amulet, something very small that he takes with him, this portable, this portable Sefer Torah. And he should be careful never to take it into the bathroom with him because it only should go to places where it's you know, appropriate to take it. But the king should never be without a Sefer Torah. And this is something I really identified with. Um, I, when I first started learning, I would carry my volume of Talmud with me everywhere I went um, as a way of reminding myself, you know, as if I would sort of to feel the physical weight of my commitment to learn. And if I ever had time, if I ever had spare time, I would learn. Um, and uh, I remember actually this meant that, as you can imagine, my volumes of Talmud became very worn from being schlucked everywhere. One time a friend came over to my house and looked at my bookshelves and said, where did you find a full set of Steinsaltz used? I've been looking for one. And I said, oh, no, I didn't find it used. I used it. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's used because I used it. So that was a, I took that to be a great compliment. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but uh, but with time, it became more and more difficult. I have a lot of young children and they're always asking me. There's a lot to carry around when you, you know, don't have a car and, and bring kids everywhere. Right. So, uh, so it, and not to mention that, you know, having a Gemara in a diaper bag doesn't always feel so appropriate. So, um, so I, uh, I started something new where I list, I take everywhere I go, I take my cell phone. I always have Shurim. I always have recorded classes on my phone. Everywhere I'm going, I'm listening to Dafyomi classes and I bring with me a little portable Mishnah everywhere I go. And if I have time to sit and learn, I try to learn all the Mishnayot. The Mishnah is the oldest parts of the Talmud. It's much more concise. I try to learn the Mishnayot and it's much, much more portable, um, everywhere I go. And I always think about, I always think about that passage with the king and his, his two Torahs scrolls whenever a lot of times I'll be listening and I say to myself oh no you're about to go into the bathroom turn off the recording of Torah so uh, it, it feels very real for me so 
Um, so so that, that, that that's a passage that's really new. It's a traditional prohibition against thinking about Torah in the bathroom. So Right, right. In fact, we're told that one, one sage, Shmuel, Babylonian, in the third century, he used to study astrology in the bathroom, only in the bathroom, because that was the one place he couldn't study Torah. He would never waste time studying astrology, well, you know, anywhere else. But I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I think we tend to say one of these Boba Mice is that Bill McGowan would study math in there. You know, so. Right, 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 right. So, Everyone so, has so, their so, vice, so, right? <laughs> you know, for, for some, this might be a downside, but as an educator, it's an upside. When I bring a book or a safer into a... Uh, uh, into a meeting, um, it, it it automatically comes up in conversation too. So it's kind of like it brings the Torah right. into, into those spaces as well. So Absolutely. just because you brought it up, one final technical question. You mentioned that sometimes you listen to the Dafyomi. Are there some you recommend? Are there some uh, audios um, that folks around the world might listen to that you recommend? Yeah. So my favorite, I've got, I've been through a lot of different recordings and also to actual Shirim. Um, but my favorite recording right now is, um, is taught by a woman named Michelle Farber who lives in Israel in Ranana. Um, she teaches a daily Dafyomi class in her home and records it in both Hebrew and English every day. Um, and, uh, the, the, what I'll, uh, the title of the podcast is Dafyomi for women with a four, although it is not by any means exclusively for women. That was her initial audience. Um, but part of what I love about her show, I guess two things I really love. One is it really sticks. She really sticks the shot of the daf, the simple meaning of the text. She'll bring in Rashi. Um, but beyond that, she really doesn't go off into all the halachic, the legal ramifications of, of the topic she's discussing. She really sticks to the page and the and the deliberations among the rabbis and also because she's teaching it as a live class in her home with surrounded by a group of people who are mostly women um when she's demonstrating principles in the talmud she'll always she'll often mention use the names of the women in the classroom so she'll say okay so let's say shoshana's ox falls into sarah's wow, pit nice. and what i like about that is you begin to imagine the wait rashi does the same thing rashi does it with ruben right. Shima, with you know with the sons of yaakov but she does it with the women in her room and in the classroom. And you begin to imagine women as actors in the yes. Talmudic dramas. Um, and why shouldn't they be? Amazing. Amazing. Keep up your amazing work and learning and inspiring so many. And uh, we appreciate very much. Appreciate you taking this time to share with us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Shana Tova. You're, you're, you're to Eric Israel, so have a great night. Shana Tova. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.